Good afternoon, Martin. Good afternoon. So Martin, you are from France? Yes. Sorry? Uh, yeah, I'm from France, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how's going on in France these days? Um, I'm not really following the, the news about the world, but uh, it's pretty messy, like, there is a lot of strike and stuff like that like the the price of the um, of the fuel has increased a lot mm -hmm. so there's a lot of issue about that mm -hmm. yeah so that's what i also heard from the news mm -hmm. so they are pretty worried about uh, the the coming winter right because yeah. of these issues. Yeah, yeah. But relatively, living in Korea is much better, right? Yes. I have no issue about what is happening. I have no idea about what is happening in the world today. So it's pretty good to like just being in your own world and everything is good. No no issue, no no strike, except, no no problem. Except for the the threatening from the North Korea, right? Yeah. Yeah, but... It's just bluffing. It's okay. For now, it's just okay. It was only one miss. And, uh, so... Yeah. Nothing to worry about. Yeah. But many people outside Korea are quite worried about the threatening from the North Korea while the Koreans living, in, living here don't care much about them, right? Yeah. But... It, I may be wrong, but it's pretty common that there is some like interaction between North and South Korea. So that's why they don't pay really much attention about that. So I got an email from yes, uh, yesterday from the uh, school administrator saying that uh, some of the students are worried about the threatening from North Korea as so they want to go back to their home country. Uh, so that's what I uh, what I got yesterday. So is there anyone who is so worried about the uh, the the the, the threatening from North Korea to want to go back home. I don't know. Hmm. I don't think it's them personally because if I have to come back in France, it's gonna be because my school said that Korea become too gen become too dangerous and have to come back. But mm -hmm. I don't think that I will come back on my own. But like maybe we people do so. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. So if there's anyone who is worried about that, don't, then I don't think it, it is a really good idea. I, I No, no, what I'm saying is that don't worry too much about the, the, the threatening from North Korea because uh, they don't have the guts to attack South Korea. Yeah. Okay, so from today, there's one thing I like, uh, there's one announcement I'd like to make. From today, if you, you guys do not show yourself to me on screen, then I will consider that absent, okay? So uh, please show your presence on the screen. Then I will, then that th 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 is gonna be fine, okay? Please show yourself from today. Otherwise, I will consider that absent even though I can see your name on the screen, uh, black screen. Professor? Mm -hmm. I'm here, I will turn my camera like in seven minutes. Uh, I'm solving one issue, but I'm here. Okay, but 
without any technical problem, you guys should show yourself. Otherwise, I will consider that as absent, okay? From today. Professor, I'm trying to check in, in through the through the app uh, of LMS, but uh, I don't know, it, it, it's still loading. It, it doesn't work. I don't know why. Okay, please try. Usually, usually it doesn't work like every, every every class usually. I'm trying, Um, I don't know why. I don't know if it's similar for other students, but usually I have like an issue of, like checking in. I already like, I already like wrote you an email maybe like twice. Okay. Like, uh, excuse me, Professor. Can I open my camera when I get home? Because I am on the road driving right now. <laughs> I'm so close. Uh, isn't it dangerous to... Yeah, it is a little bit dangerous, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Um, I, can I open the camera when I get home? Yeah, yeah. So, because it's dangerous, so you can turn it off and you do turn oh, yeah. off the video. Yeah. Oh, Just you. for this time. So, next time you should be at some uh, safe place. Okay. A proper place. Yep, yep. Yep, thank you. Okay. Okay. So, as I said, if you do not show yourself on the screen, I will consider that absent. Okay. Okay, so uh, today, uh, before we going into the uh, portfolio uh, risk and returns, one of the students uh, raised a question about uh, internal rate of return. Okay, so I'm gonna deal with these questions first and then move on to the uh, risk and return of a, port a portable risk and return, okay? Okay, the question is, um, she, uh, yeah, was she, <clears throat> she has some questions, I uh, has some, and need more understanding on the multiple rates of return. So why we have uh, the multiple rates of multiple uh, internal rate of return, okay? Um, internal rate of return is basically, right? Internal rate of return is basically break even rates, which means that if you discount the cash flows at internal rate of return, net present value, is supposed to be zero, right? That's why internal value of return is also called break-even rate. So if we have, uh, this, is, this is gonna be an initial investment, right? And if we have uh, only positive cash flows, right, in the future, then there'll be one, there'll be only one internal value of return. But if the cash flows changes from positive to negative, in the, at some point in the future, then you're gonna have a one more internal rate of return that makes the, the present value of the cash flow zero, that's equal, equal to the initial investment, okay? Like what, this is, this is because, let's, let's say, um, Minus plus 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 cash flow in terms of cash the, the sign of a cash flow, you're gonna have a one internal rate of return. And if the changes the, the signs of cash flow changes from positive to negative, like this, then probably just uh, intuitively from here to here, another stream of cash flows, right? So you may have, uh, you, you, you are, you, you're going to have another internal rate of return that makes the cash flows equal to zero, okay? So the principle is that as far as the, the sign of a cash flows in the future changes from uh, positive to negative, but just only even um, more than once, then you are supposed to have two 
more than one interval returns. Okay, so then it is difficult to which one should we take as a, a break-even rate. So you, if you have a more than one interval return, you are supposed to use net present value, right? So if you have a more than one project and um, each project has more than one internal rate return, then you should take, mm -hmm. you should use the net present value and take the project which has, which, uh, take the project with the highest net present value because the net present value is just one even though the science of science of cash flows changes in the future, okay? So if the cash, if the science of cash flows changes more than one, more than one time, you are supposed to have a more than one internal rate of return. In that case, you better use the net present value. So net present value, uh, the product with the highest net present value is going to be the one you want to take. But having said that, yeah. So, uh, as far as I understood, if we have the, if we see this pattern of changing the science uh, in uh, NPV, we just uh, don't use uh, our uh, internal interest rate. And just do NPV. We, we don't mind because uh, in Excel it, it doesn't see the second or the third uh, IRR. It it considers only the first one that uh, appears. So we don't need to calculate it. Yeah, in the Excel, if you uh, the Excel the or the financial calculator doesn't show to more than one. Uh, does not show two or three more uh, entire rate return. Just the one, just the first one. They don't have the function of producing uh, or in, uh, internal rate of return. Okay, so yeah, that's true. So, but what I'm saying is that if the signs of cash flows in future cash flow changes, you should expect that there will be more than one internal rate of return, right? That's the thing you should make it. Uh, you should have in mind. So, uh, I think there's a way to uh, have. Uh, uh, to calculate uh, the order in the rate return is necessarily a technical one. So the, the important thing is that, oh, looking at the cash flows and the science of the cash flow change more than one time, then you should expect, oh, there will be more than one internal rate of return. So like, like this, so here, this is the uh, cash flow, right? Minus plus minus. So we are supposed to have uh, supposed to have a two internal rate of return that makes the net present value zero, right? 25% and 30.3% or locally. So if the discount rate between this range, you are gonna have positive net present value, right? So uh, I'm not saying that you should uh, ignore totally these two internal rate of return because as far as we have a discount rate between this range, then we are gonna have a positive net present value. But conveniently, if you have a more than one internal rate of return, it will be better to use net present value, right? So Yana, you get it? Yes, I get it. Thank you. Okay. And um, there is a conflict um, between that present value and internal rate of return. Okay. As for the internal rate of return, we have the um, norm that the project, we, uh, we are supposed to take the project with the highest internal rate of return because uh, if the internal rate of return, uh, the one project that has a higher internal rate of return, higher internal rate of return than the other one, then 
the highest uh, the product with the highest interest is better than the latter, better than the latter, right? That's the normal we have uh, about the internal rate of one. But depending on the, the cash flow, um, the the order of cash, depending on the, the stream uh, the, the stream of cash flows, as you can see here, uh, product A, product B. If you look uh, looking at only internal rate of return, project A seems to be better than project B because it's higher than project B, right? 29% project A and uh, project B 23%. So uh, without considering the discount rate, actual discount rate, the cost of capital, okay? We, if, if you uh, do not consider cost of capital or discount rate without considering this, this cost of capital discount rate used to make, used to, used to calculate net present value, right? So uh, before considering net present value, if you're simply looking at, uh, look at the internal rate of return, then, oh, product A is higher than product B, uh, the internal rate of return product A is higher than product B. So then, oh, product A is going to be better than product B. You may make this say, uh, this uh, make decision like that. But once you, but once you consider the cost of capital or discount rate, let's say discount rate is ten, zero, uh, five percent. Okay, not zero percent. Uh, we don't have any zero percent. So if, if the recovery rate of the five percent, then as you can see here, uh, in terms of net present value, product B shows a high, a higher net present value than project A, right? So depend. This is because of the cash flow. If the project B has a, in the short term, it has in terms of cash flow, it has a lower cash flow, and in the long term it has a higher cash flow. And product A, in the short term, it has a higher cash, flow, but in the, uh, in, the, in the long term, it has a uh, lower cash. So because of this cash flow, the lower discount rate, lower discount rate has a less effect on the, uh, on the, uh, in, uh, the in the, uh, in the, a long term cash flow. So, product B, in terms of net present value, has a higher value than product A. But if you, if the discount rate, uh, or discount rate increases, then the product A, in terms of net present value, has a higher value than project B. So then uh, from, let's say uh, from 10%, it, 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 uh, from 10%, 15%, 20%, uh, I mean, at the discount rate at 10%, 15%, 20%, you can see um, there is no mismatch between IRR and the net present value between the project A and project B. So all in all, When you have, uh, um, even if an uh, internal rate of return is a uh, higher, uh, higher than the other, if one product has a higher internal rate of return than the other, you need to also consider net present value because uh, depending on the cost of capital, discount rate, net present value, may tear differently from the internal rate of return. Okay? So um, it is always better to have, uh, to, uh, to, run, uh, to run the um, valuation the using not only internal rate of return, but also uh, that present value method, okay? That is the safest way in terms of capital budgeting. Um, this 
the 8.32 percent is uh, um, break even break even rate based on the the difference difference in cash flow between product and product. If you uh, double click this uh, Excel sheet, then you, you can see how to calculate this 8.32 percent. This is the same way as same way as calculating internal rate of return using the Excel. So um, yeah, once you know this break even rate, then as far as the recovery rate of return is lower than this break even rate, then that, uh, there is there will be some conflict between present value and rate of return. Or if if recovery return is higher than this break even rate, then you're gonna have no mismatch between the two methods. So uh, the surest way to understand that this uh, conflict between the present value and IR is to um, manipulate this uh, Excel uh, spreadsheet to find out what is happening when you change these cash flows and uh, discount rate, apply the different discount rate. Okay. So, um, yeah. Any questions? Okay. Okay, we are quite uh, behind the schedule. So I'm gonna move a little bit faster uh, than uh, before. We uh, talked about this normal distribution. So um, the, the stock return, I mean, if you make a capital investment, then the returns is gonna be, um, is one of the, it's gonna be the buried, uh, you know, yeah. In a very, uh, yeah, you want to have a di different returns. So we assume that the stock returns shows the normal distribution. Okay, normal distribution means that uh, the mean is at the center of the whole distribution returns. Okay, and uh, this is mean, right? Uh, mean. So the farther uh, the return away from the mean, we, we, uh, we consider uh, the stock uh, as a volat um, 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 more volatile, okay? So we basically don't like uh, uncertainty or uh, surprises or significant changes from our um, of our expectation okay so mean okay mean is kind of uh, our expectation okay where we expect uh, a certain uh, rate of return from this investment so that would be the mean expected return but when uh, the actual return, uh, the more uh, the actual return deviate from the expected return, we call it risk. Okay, so the more the actual return deviate from this mean, the 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 riskier it is. Okay. So, but in another way, in terms of a probability, if you spread out the range of returns, then there's more uh, spread out the returns from mean, then the range will cover most of the outcomes from the investment, right? So as you, as you, as you can see here, uh, from the normal distribution, if the return deviate to uh, uh, one deviation, two deviation, three deviation, deviate uh, uh, by three the standard deviation, if the, um, the return deviated by standard deviation from the mean, then 
99% of return, 99% of outcomes will be covered within this range. Okay, like here. So the more, uh, the less the range is, uh, the less probability that the outcomes will be covered within this range. Okay. So that, 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 that is the how to read this, um, the, 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 probabi uh, the probability of the uh, outcomes uh, based on this normal distribution. So in this question, standard deviation is 9.9 .9 and the mean return is a six point. So one standard deviation, one standard deviation from the mean is exactly 0 0.9 plus or minus one standard deviation is 9.9, .9, right? So this is gonna be plus, uh, plus 15.9 or minus 3.3, right? So here, one standard deviation, 0.6, Right. This is one standard deviation. So three point nine exactly one stand. Sorry, three point nine exactly one standard deviation. Then if if actual return deviate one uh, deviate uh, uh, by one standard deviation, right? So then we have six to eight percent. 68% of uh, uh, the range it covers the 68 80% of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the probability of covering the outcomes. But the question is uh, the less than 0.9% and we should calculate this percentage, right? So then, um, this is 68%, right? And this normal distribution is, is a, a, a symmetrical. So uh, this part is two of 32, right? So 16% and 16%, okay? So this is gonna be 16%. So what the range of returns would you expect to see 95% of the range and that's by some of the, the time. This is the 95%. So from the mean, you should, uh, if you, if the, uh, if, if from the mean two standard deviation will cover 95% of, uh, of the returns. Okay, 95% of the outcomes. So, 6.0 plus or minus two multiplied by 9.9, .9. okay? How about 99%? 6.0 plus or minus three, 9.9. .9. Then 99% of the outcomes will be covered roughly, okay? You guys get it? Okay, I'm gonna pass that. Uh, this is the uh, G value. G value is, okay, in this case, we, if we, uh, this number is just intentionally made, uh, um, uh, if you debate or just one standard, which we have exactly 3.9%. But what if, what if uh, uh, this is standard deviation, this is the, uh, the variable the outcomes, this is the uh, mu, the, um, the, uh, the the mean, right? This is mean, and this is a variable outcome, right? And this is standard deviation. So if uh, if you want to know the if the return is not three point nine, if the return is maybe two point nine or one point six, whatever. So if you uh, want to know the probability if you want to know the probability of uh, the uh, return 
uh, uh, less than a specific uh, return, then you can use this G value. So if you have a G value, then this uh, table shows that, let's say G value is the here, right? Oh, okay, if you have, uh, um, this is zero, if you want, if you want to know what is the percent the probability of uh, return uh, less than specific return, okay? So yes, X, right? So this table shows the probability this side, okay? Less than uh, X percentage. I'm, I'm not going to details, uh, but roughly, uh, I just want you to, uh, if you have time, uh, try to, uh, if you have time, try to understand the G value, okay? But this is a table uh, to find out uh, uh, the uh, probability of uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, um, probability that of, of the return of um, probability that uh, some super specific uh, rare return Okay, if you want to know the, what is the probability of having um, less than certain amount of return, okay? This one shows, this is positive numbers, right? So this is mean, if you have positive numbers, if you have a certain amount, then this shows this part. So if you want to know this part, you just simply need, need to one minus this percentage, right? Then you're gonna have this, uh, this part of uh, the probability. So if you want to know X, uh, uh, higher than, higher than the X, X percentage returns, then you should use this table, okay? That's all. Um, this is not that, um, this is more statistical, statistics a matter. So, okay, I, I'm gonna, if you have time, I'm gonna dig into this uh, later, okay? This, at this time, at this moment, that, that, that's the really important. Okay, so today, the main topic today is portfolio. So portfolio, um, this is the, uh, the publications by um, the forefather of uh, uh, portfolio theory, who is, Harry Markowitz. So why do we study this corporate finance? Why do we study um, the uh, corporate finance? Mostly because of uh, this guy, Mary ha Harry Markowitz. Um, because he's the guy who come up with uh, uh, portfolio theory. Portfolio theory is uh, basically how to maximize our returns for the lowest uh, level of risk, right? So he is the one who uh, proposed, oh, this is the way to uh, achieve that objectives. So the key assumption of his, uh, of his, uh, of his uh, portfolio theory is that Investors are risk covers. Risk covers means nobody likes to take on risk. They want to minimize risk as possible. That's the initial, that's the primary assumption. Okay. And um, this post-portfolio theory, modern post-portfolio theory, yeah, modern post-portfolio theory is a practical, practical method for selecting investment in order to maximize uh, overall returns within acceptable level of risk. So return is high and risk lower. That is the best, uh, that is the optimal solution to the, uh, that, is, that, is, that is the solution we want, uh, we want to achieve. Then how? how you can achieve these uh, objectives. The best is diversification. So if you diversify your investment, there is a way to achieve this objective. 
maximize your returns within your own acceptable level of uh, risk. So basically, acceptable level is good, though lower the better. Okay. In so because we uh, in in the portfolio theory uh, theory the diversification is the king. So uh, what the, the key interest in portfolio theory is uh, the overall picture rather than the um, the rather than the focus on single investment. So um, in the portfolio theory, they. Uh, they in the it is more uh, it is more important to uh, to understand how one invest uh, how one specific S classes interact with other classes how how one stock uh, how one specific stock interact uh, have impact on other uh, other uh, other uh, uh, other stocks as a whole so the portfolio theory do not uh, has a uh, uh, over uh, do not uh, more concerned uh, with the the um, overall returns rather than the overall return in terms of uh, relationship among the investments. Okay, so that's why single investments performance is less important than how it impacts the entire portfolio. So we should talk about variance and the correlation. Variance, uh, portfolio variance and the portfolio correlation. Because this, uh, this variance of correlation, correlations is the key uh, factors for diversification, okay? So efficient frontier. So um, portfolio theory is basically, uh, in terms of efficiency in investment, higher return, lower risk. That is the efficiency. Okay. So here, this is the efficient frontier. So if you have a combination of investments and if the expected return, you, you expect the return is 5% and the standard deviation, standard deviation is uh, the volatility of, standard deviation is the risk of uh, on the investment, right? So you expect uh, you expect to return five percent, and uh, uh, your ter uh, risk tolerance level is ten percent. So ten percent deviation standard deviation means that oh, I'm fine with uh, um, ten percent uh, deviation from the from my expected value expected the return. So five percent five percent is my expected uh, return. So from 5%, plus or minus 10%, plus my 10% means plus, plus 0.5% or minus 5%. Within this range, I'm fine. That is the uh, acceptable level of uh, risk, right? So, uh, based on this expected return and uh, uh, acceptable level of return, uh, acceptable level of uh, risk, you need to find out the combination of uh, investments. Okay, that uh, meet these uh, requirements: five percent expected return and the ten percent uh, standard deviation. Okay. So if you make a combination of, or make, make a combination of investment at some point uh, based on various allocations of investments, you may find one 
specific combinations that achieve uh, this return and risk. So this line, this line basically shows that combination, that uh, that combination of investment enable that enables you reach this specific objectives. In this, on this line, on, on this point, uh, you can achieve six percent and uh, let's say thirteen percent st standard deviation, something like that. So this is called the efficient frontier. Uh, this is very method mathematical process, but you don't have to care about mathematical process, but just need to understand the concept. I just try to read, uh, try to understand uh, this um, efficient frontier. What this efficient frontier is about? Okay. Any question? No. Okay. I'm gonna go faster a little bit. Um, you have two, let's say you have two stocks, stock A, stock U. This is from the text. You have two stocks. And then if you are supposed to take either one, stock A or stock U, then this is the way how to calculate uh, um, the expected return, depending on uh, based on the, the probability of uh, the state of economy. Okay, so you have you let's say you chose a stock L, okay, and uh, the stock L is gonna have a minus twenty percent return in recession, and in the boom period, it's gonna have a seventy percent of a return, right? So. Based on this information and the, the, the probability state of economy, uh, the recession the probability uh, of having recession is 50% and the uh, probability of having boom is 50%, right? So then, we, uh, then the expected return of uh, uh, from stock air is calculated uh, to uh, this probability the 0.50% probability of a recession multiplied by the uh, expected return, uh, the, the return, uh, um, uh, the side air return in recession, then this minus, minus on minus a zero point, uh, minus 0.1%. And the boom, during the boom, you're gonna, have, you, you, you expect it in 70% or 0 0.7 return. So you multiply 50% chance of a boom with the, the rate of return is 70% or 0 0.7, then you wanna have 0 0.35. If you add these two, you wanna have a 0.25. This is very uh, simple um, process. Okay, then the same goes for the stock U. So if you simply supposed to take either stock air, stock U, the way to, uh, to calculate the return is like this, right? Is that this is not that complicated, right? This is probability, and uh, as for the stock area, this is gonna be return for each state of economy. So if you want to know the expected the, the return of uh, stock air, you simply multiply probably the state of the economy and uh, the rate of return during recession or in, take, in case of boom, the probability of uh, having boom and uh, multiply it with uh, the rate of return during boom. So then you have two return depending on the recession, uh, the state of economy recession of boom. So if you add these two, 
then you're going to have expected return of stock L. So the same goes for stock U. So this is uh, this is the case where you uh, the stock L and stock U are mutually exclusive, right? This is not this is not that complicated, right? Not at all. And what if we, as I said, here if you see, oh, during recession, stock air shows a twenty percent return, minus twenty percent, boom seventy percent, stock U thirty percent, and temp. so you may think, oh, what if I have uh, both stock? Rather than uh, just the thing, uh, just the, uh, only stock air, stock U, you may think of uh, um, having uh, both stocks. So then, what will happen to the uh, return? You may need to, uh, uh, you may want to see uh, the result of having uh, both stock. That is the uh, portfolio, two asset portfolio, right? So. Oh, okay. Um, then how to calculate the uh, uh, portfolio return, the two asset portfolio. So let's say I'm gonna have, uh, I'm, I have a 100, I have a, uh, some, um, I have my own capital, right? Some money, right? I have money and I'm gonna invest 50% to start air. And another fifty percent stock U. Here, in this case, I have a money. I invest one hundred percent stock L O on one hundred percent stock U. In this case, we have this uh, type of uh, return. We have you know, we calculated the return in this way. But here, we uh, we uh, I I, I want to diversify my investment in, into this stock air stock U, right? Here, no diversification. But here, diversification. You uh, diversify your investment into stock air and stock U by 50%, by 50 and 50. So how then how to calculate the portable return when you have two assets by, uh, by half and half? And this is the how we calculate the fifty percent of uh, you invested. Um, you allocated fifty percent of your capital to stock air, right? So the, in case of a recession, you uh, stock air has a, a return uh, of minus twenty percent. So you uh, multiply fifty uh, percent. Fifty percent was allocated to stock air. So you multiply zero point five with the minus 20% and you allocated 50% to stock U. So you're gonna have 50% of uh, stock U return, 30%. So during recession, you have a 5% return. You expect 5% return. Here, so you, if you have both stock air and stock U, you are gonna expect a 5% return before we taking account of the probability state of economy, right? But here, um, it depending on which stock you choose, could it be minus 20% or could it be 30%? So it's kind of a lock, right? You don't know how, what it happened when, when you uh, purchase the stock as stock U, right? So it could it be lock. If you choose U, then in, during recession, you will have a 30%. But here we do not rely on luck. We um, have a more. We rely on the chance, uh, the probability. We, we we rely on the benefits of diversification. So five percent during recession, we expect five percent. Where, hey, what? what why don't we take a stock yield? Because we, during recession, we can take we can have thirty percent. But it's a really risky, right? Risky, because you know um, the stock errors 
errors, uh, stack errors uh, return and uh, um, the, the, the minus 20%, the 30%, uh, minus 20%, the 70%, minus 20% during recession, minus 20% and boom is 70%, right? Stack new, 30%, uh, 10%, and 30%. The range, right? The range, uh, the stock area may seem to be more riskier than stock year because of the the range of uh, the, re, uh, the 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 spread of the return, right? So, what what if we simply take a stock year, then we can expect a thirty percent and during recession and boom uh, and during boom ten percent. But what? But then, if you start take you, then you may lose the the chance of getting seventy percent uh, of a return during boom period. So, if you have a both stock, if you have a construct portfolio have over having both stock during recession, you have you may expect five percent uh, of return during boom. The same method applied, so then you expect forty percent, and then you apply the probability of uh, the state of economy fifty percent. So if you apply this fifty percent and fifty percent to forty percent, fifty percent to five percent apply, fifty percent to five percent apply, fifty percent to forty percent, then you have a twenty two point five percent and twenty percent. If you add these two, then you have a 22.5%. So if you have a, a portfolio of these two assets, you can expect uh, whether you have a recession or boom, you can you may expect a 22.5% return over having these two asset portfolio. But here, this portfolio. Here, if you take if you have a, a stock A or stock uh, U, you may have a, a maybe twenty five percent or maybe twenty percent. So, but if if you put all the capital in, into one single uh, stock, then there is a risk of uh, deviation of 25 and 20, right? But if you have both stock, then you have 22.5% between these two, okay? So this 22.5% is close, closer to the mean, okay? So even though, this expected return it look, uh, looks uh, it is lower than the 25%. This, 20, uh, this portfolio return has a lower risk than this stock air, right? And this 22.5% is a higher return than this stock U, right? Stock area shows uh, between the range is minus percent, minus twenty percent to seventy percent. Huge difference. Okay. If you have a, a both stocks, you don't have a, the, the the portfolio of both stocks, then you don't have uh, why have this uh, this twenty two five percent uh, respect return. You are, you are not supposed to have a lower. Uh, Lower risk. How 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 can you know do we have a low risk? By calculating portfolio variance and the standard deviation. So if a portfolio standard variance standard deviation is lower than the single stocks uh, uh, variance and standard deviation, then ah uh, we have. Uh, lower risk and uh, higher return. Okay. So we are gonna take a look at this variance standard a bit later. 
first of all, I'd like you guys to uh, understand the first the portfolio return, how to calculate the portfolio return. So you own a portfolio of 25% investment in stock X, 35% of stock Y, and 40% stock Z. And uh, all these stocks have uh, 10%, 13%, and 15%, respectively. So what is the expected return on the portfolio? How to calculate it? It is pretty simple, right? And straightforward. Ten percent multiplied by twenty-five percent, right? Plus thirteen percent multiplied by thirty-five percent, right? Plus fifteen percent multiplied by 40%, right? Then you have expected return. Expected return, right? If you add these three, right? Pretty simple. So the calculation of the expected return on portable return is pretty simple. I think if you have time, you, you, you uh, calculate this, uh, the portable return. Okay, oh, based on this information. The key is variance, variance and the standard deviation in the portfolio. Uh, in the investment, we more focused on the risk management rather than uh, return maximization. Okay, so you understand on the variance and standard deviation from a portfolio uh, on a portfolio basis is very, very important. This is the case where we are supposed to invest 100% stock L or 100% stock U. Okay, so if you invest all your, uh, all your capital into stock air, stock U, then this is the expected return and the variance and the standard deviation. You may, you, you could use uh, XR or financial calculator to calculate, uh, uh, to, to get this variance standard deviation of each stock based on their, uh, based on their, based on these numbers, okay? You, it, it is not difficult to follow this process, okay? So I, I'm not going to do, I, I'm not gonna get into the, uh, the process in details, but let's assume, let's assume that I understand and you guys understand how to calculate this uh, expect return of variance and standard deviation with this each stock, okay? So this is the, the, the key is, uh, it is not that very important to how you have the ability to calculate the, the dividend uh, variance and the standard deviation. The more important thing is that you have the concept of what the variance and standard deviation actually means in terms of a portfolio. That's more important, okay? So don't focus on the formulas and calculations, okay? Try to have, uh, have a, uh, try to, uh, try to, uh, try to ha understand the big picture based on the concept of this, uh, how this variance standard deviation is supposed to mean in, uh, in, in, in the investment, that, that, that's more important, okay? So we have this variance standard deviation of each stock, okay? But this is the way, uh, and this is the, uh, the portfolio, you have, a, let's say 50-50 or 40% uh, 40, uh, 40 60 or 30% 70, you allocate your investment to, when you have a two, if you have only two stocks in the world, you allocate your capital into stock air and stock U, right? This is, this is called the weight. 
okay? Depending on your valuation of stock area stack mu, you may uh, change the allocation of your capital to uh, this uh, stock. But anyway, so in this uh, case, uh, you allocate half of your capital to stock air, half of the other half to stock U. Then, This is the way to calculate the standard deviation, right? You guys remember this 0 0.225 is the return, portfolio return. Here, portfolio return, okay? And you deduct this portfolio return from The return portfolio, uh, the, 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 the average return. So this is average portfolio return. So you deduct the average portfolio return from the portfolio return in case of recession, and you deduct the average uh, the the portfolio return from the return on the boom period, right? Then, then squared, this result is squared, and then you're gonna have this number, and if, and you multiply the possibility of each state of economy, then you have these two numbers, and if you add these two numbers, then you have standard deviation of this portfolio. So, this is 17.5%, okay? So, oh, if you compare this 7.5% with the stock R and stock U, this 7.5% is lower than stock R when you invest 100%, right? And, this 70.5% is higher than stock U. The catch is, but, 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 because the 75.5% is lower than uh, the uh, standard deviation stock air, you prefer, because you prefer lower risk. So it is good in terms of risk, right? Portfolio. Uh, it is better to take uh, to have uh, to construct a portfolio rather than uh, have uh, just the single stock uh, the stock air right. But in case of stock U, even though the standard deviation is uh, higher than the standard deviation of stock U, you have higher return. Higher return is twenty two point five percent. Okay, then stock use. Stock use return is 20%. Okay. So that's that 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 is kind of a trade-off between return and the risk. Um so The portfolio, when you construct a portfolio, the thing, the key is you maximize the return and uh, minimize the risk. So this is just the one case, uh, this is a one case where you can uh, see some difference uh, between the investment in single asset and uh, uh, portfolio, okay? Um, here, when you calculated this uh, standard deviation, we did not use uh, the, very, um, the correlation, uh, covariance co or correlation. Uh, the reason is that uh, we simply use the, the probability uh, 
probability of each uh, uh, expected return. But if you do not have uh, such a probability, okay, such probability, then you are supposed to calculate the covariance of uh, these two stocks. Um, this slide simply shows how to calculate portable return, how to calculate the portable variance. So you, 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 if you have time, just take a look at this slide. Um, this is a slide how to calculate the portfolio variance and standard deviation without probability of state. So let's say you simply have both stocks that shows uh, uh, re expect return 10% uh, or 15%. Okay. So then how to calculate the portfolio standard deviation. This is the way how to calculate the standard deviation of uh, two asset portfolio. First, you should set the weighting or proportion of each stock in your investment. So let's say stock A 50%, stock B 50%. This is the weighting. But here, the, uh, this is not, you should ignore this one. Okay. Let's say stock A 50% or look, you allocate a capital or 50% capital, you allocate 50% capital stock A, you allocate 50% of capital stock B, right? So then first, so you set the weighting of, uh, uh, of each star, how much of your capital, how much of capital will be allocated to each star, okay? When you have two star, then you calculate the variance of each star you can calculate the variance of each stock. When you have this 10% uh, expected return, this is based on the many random returns, right? So based on many random returns, you get this uh, um, expected return. So among the variance, uh, among the random returns, you can calculate the uh, variance, of, uh, variance of stock A or stock B. Right, so you calculate the variance of each star, and then you calculate the covariance of the star uh, A and B. The covariance means that how star A and star B move, how much uh, star A and star B move closely together. So here. Um, This is, the, uh, this is the formula for calculated the portfolio variance, but you don't have to concern about uh, the, how to calculate the portfolio or variance. So the concept you need to understand in the portfolio variance is, is the covariance. Covariance. Covariance is when you have in your portfolio, when you have two asset, two stuff, A and B, covariance is when stock A increases, sometimes stock B may also increase as well. Or when stock A increases, stock B may decrease in terms of a price, stock price. So covariance is this is uh, there's a way to calculate the covariance the, the covariance based on the, the, the statistical formula but the important the, the important thing is that what the covariance means covariance is how closely uh, how cl um, whether the stock a and stock b movers together or not, that is covariance. If the stock of A and B moves together, then 
I mean, when stock A, uh, stock A increase, stock price increase and stock B also increases, then, oh, they have a positive, they may have a positive covariance. Or if stock A increases, when stock A increases, when stock B decreases, then they have a positive a negative covariance, negative relationship between the two in terms of stock price. Okay, that is the covariance. Covariance, covariance. So stock A, stock B, they 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 are buried in terms of price, right? Every time. But if they uh, they co-vary, if they co-vary, then they have a positive covariance. If they have they if they cooperate together in a positive way, one one stock increases, the other one is also increases. One stock, then we call uh, we we can say oh both stock has a positive covariance, positive relationship, right? But if one stock uh, stock A increases, the other stock it decreases, then we can say they have a negative corporate, negative relationship, negative or variance, okay? That's important in terms of, in terms of for the diversification. Why do we diversify our investment? Because we don't want to put all the eggs in one basket, right? If you put all the uh, uh, eggs in one basket, they all the eggs are fragile, right? But if there is a, uh, something uh, less fragile in the basket, then it is a safer. So if A and B has very strong covariance, shows very covariance, they, we do not, we cannot say that, oh, our investment was diversified, right? That's why covariance is important in terms of diversification. Oh, uh, yeah. So before we move, uh, before we move on uh, move further, we, you guys need to know uh, some uh, Greek alphabet. So, this is alpha, yeah, and beta, and mu. Mu literally mean, okay, and sigma, right, standard deviation, and rho. Rho is correlation. Correlation, we're gonna take a look at correlation soon. So, this is this is the, um, the 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 Greek alphabet that comes up uh, while studying the uh, total risk and return. Okay, so just for your uh, information, so covariance is the measure of a degree to which two stars co-vary. So let's say A and B, say A and B. This is the uh, return increases. It, 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 when A increases, B also increases, then they're gonna have, have a positive covariance. But if A increases and B decreases, then they may have a negative, right? A increases, right? They may have negative. Not this way. Um, a increase, a, a, a increase. Yeah, B, B increases, A decreases like this. Yeah, this way. 
right? This is positive, and this is negative covariance. This is the uh, formula to get the covariance, but this is not that important uh, because you want to use the Excel or financial calculator to get to get this uh, covariance. Here, this one. Uh, this is the correlation. Correlation is just the. Uh, um, it's kind of a. Uh, shows how strong, how strong the positive or negative relationship between the two assets. The correlation shows how strong, uh, how strongly they are, uh, they move together, in term, uh, move together negatively or positively, okay? The, the, the correlation efficient correlation uh, correlation coefficient is, is this specific numbers that shows uh, how strongly they move together. Okay, so correlation is a statistical measure that the, the, the um, statistical measures to uh, to show that how the two securities move uh, together in, uh, to move together two securities right two securities. So this. The range of correlation is plus minus uh, plus minus one to plus one. Okay. Zero minus one plus one. If the correlation of coefficient between the two assets shows a plus one, then they exactly move together linearly. If one stock increases, uh, the other one stock also increases exactly the same degree. And if they, if the correlation copy is negative, they exactly move in in opposite way, okay? And if the correlation copy is zero, then they have no relationship between the two in terms of uh, changes in stock prices. Okay. This is a unit free. There's no specific unit of any any specific unit. Okay, just unit free. So just the numbers between um, minus one and plus one. So as we as the correlation copies uh, move uh, move closer to plus one, then they had they have a very strong uh, relation, a positive relationship. And if move to negative, they show negative relationship. Okay, so the one question is, which one is gonna be better? Um, okay, this is the question. In which of the following situation would you get the largest reduction risk by spreading your investment across the stock? A, two shares are perfectly correlated. There's no correlation. There's a modest negative correlation. There's a perfect negative correlation. So which one is the, the best for the last reduction in risk? Jana? Maybe, maybe modest yeah. negative correlation? Sorry? Modest negative correlation. Modest, okay. How about um, Marco? What do you think? Uh, uh, I think the same. Same? Okay. How about um, so there are some people, there are some students who do not show it themselves. I don't know. Ellie, Ellie, you're not there. If you guys do not show yourself, then I said you guys, 
going to be treated as absent, okay? El, you are not there. Epigeni, Epigeni, you are there. Yes, Professor, I'm here. So what do you think? What do you think? I think, uh, I think the, the answer is also C. C? Where? <clears throat> okay. The question is the largest reduction in risk by spreading your investment across the stock. So, if those two stocks, A and B, shows the perfect negative, if they have never, you guys know that basically A and B should show negative correlation, right? So then you want to have a, a, a diversification effect. The largest reduction comes from perfect negative relationship, minus one, right? So if A increased, A increased, the other one decreases, or if uh, A bit increased, the other one decreases. In, when it comes to return, when it comes to return, may not be ideal, right? May not be ideal, but the question is the largest reduction in risk, not concerning the, without concerning the return, right? Without concerning return, the largest reduction in risk is gonna be, is gonna come from perfect negative correlation. But if you think of return as well, then you may go to modest, modest negative correlation. Right? So where if the question is optimal reduction in risk, then probably C is the correct answer. But the question is simply saying largest reduction in risk by spreading your investment across to stop. No mention about return, right? So then the question is gonna be D. Negative correlation, perfect negative correlation is gonna uh, have the lowest, uh, lowest reduction, lowest, redu lowest risk, which means that lowest standard deviation, lowest variability, right? So like this, you have one, the stock A is 10%. When stock A 10%, let's say the stock B is gonna have a minus 10%, right? So then 0%. They're gonna always uh, zero. Uh, the return expected return is zero. So in terms of the standard, uh, in uh, when you look in terms of a distribution, this is gonna be always uh, here. Here, right, here. So then zero standard deviation. Then when you have standard deviation is the risk, right? Volatility, volatility is measured by variance of standard deviation. So when you have a zero standard deviation, zero risk. That's why perfect negative is the largest reduction in risk. Okay, you get it? Uh, take on this written question, and then uh, you're, I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, wrap it up. So take a look at this question. I'm gonna give you one minute.
this is the numbers correlations uh, in case of this one correlation between East Asian inquiries and the Brazilian inquiries, right? This one, correlation between European inquiries and the Brazilian inquiries, okay? So, um, Hyojin, yes. so what's your answer? Um, European inquiries, B. B? Ooh, can I ask why? So the question is based on solely on the information in the above table, which equally asset class is the most sharply distinguished, distinguished from the US equally? So you need to see this, uh, this row, right? This row. Then, could you think again? Um, A? Yes, Brazilian equities, because it shows lowest, right? Correlation. Distinguished from US equity means that it should show less correlation, right? So then it is distinguished from the US inquiries. Okay. Okay, this is all for today. And I'm gonna cover the rest of the uh, slides in, in the next class. Okay. Okay, any questions? Okay, please show you, sorry. Uh, you have, you show this, the rest of the slides about systematic risk. So the parts with the uh, systematic risks and uh, all the formulas that you uploaded on the previous class, we'll, we will say it's on Thursday? Yeah, this Thursday. Uh, so, okay, thank what, what, so, so could, what do you mean? Could you say again? What? Uh, uh, you uploaded the slides with the capital asset pricing model. Oh, yeah, and... yeah, 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 yeah. Next, next, ne next class, yeah. This Thursday. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm going to cover all the rest of that this Thursday. Okay. Any questions? No? Oh, okay. Professor, I, I have a question. Uh -huh. ask. How you how are you checking the attendance? Like where there are some people who do not show themselves. So I'm going to take <laughs> Hey, this is the kind of uh, no. I'm I'm uh, sorry. I mean, like, are you checking it by, like, one by one during the class or after the class? So I was just yeah, I'm, about it. I'm checking uh, uh, based on this uh, the ch uh, chatting box. If you uh, the type in your uh, ID, then I take them as a uh, presence. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, Professor. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so we don't have time. So you, some of you guys have next class. Okay, see you this Thursday. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Bye bye.